All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Uh, welcome to this uh, Thinking with the Saints event. So glad you guys are here to join us. My name is Travis Pickell. I'm uh, the Associate Director of University Engagement at Anselm House, which is a Center for Christian Study at the University of Minnesota. For those of you who are new to Anselm House, we invite you to go check out our website, uh, www.anselmhouse.org, where you can learn more about our various public events and, and programs. Anselm House is, um, we exist to help connect Christian faith and knowledge with all of life uh, at the University of Minnesota and beyond. So we're really glad all of you are here with us tonight uh, for a really exciting event. Um, tonight's talk is gonna be part of our Thinking with the Saints series. Uh, it's We began this last year and uh, are excited to continue it. Thinking with the Saints has grown out of our uh, desire to bring voices from within the Christian tradition into dialogue with the university uh, in various disciplines and uh, areas of the university and uh, to, to bring what they what the Christian tradition might have to bear um, in terms of wisdom in terms of um, uh, knowledge and perspective into those uh, those places. So where Christianity can uh, speak into a current academic issue or or matter, we are uh, hoping to bring this dialogue into being. So so tonight's uh, Thinking with the Saints event is thinking with Soren Kierkegaard about anxiety, depression, and despair. Uh, anxiety and depression and despair obviously being a um, a large topic in the public consciousness, uh, one um, where I think many people are recognizing the growth of uh, at least the recognition of mental health issues related to anxiety and depression and um, new modes of sort of treating or dealing with that on an individual level, on a medical level, or on a social level. And so um, we want to um, bring Soren Kierkegaard and his thought into conversation with some of these questions tonight. And in order to do so, uh, we've invited Professor Gordon Marino. Uh, professor Marino is an emeritus professor of philosophy at St. Olaf College and longtime director of the um, Hong Kierkegaard Library. And I'm going to go ahead and help Gordon get his uh, camera on here. There we go. Uh, and um, just to sort of tell you a little bit about his background, Professor Marino is the author of uh, the book Kierkegaard in the Present Age and co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Kierkegaard. And most recently uh, has written a book that I, I really enjoyed called The Existentialist Survival Guide, How to Live Authentically in an Inauthentic Age. Uh, and some of the themes from that book will um, come up tonight, I'm sure. Um, and he's also uh, uh, some, something of a public intellectual. He's, he's published, he publishes regularly in national periodicals like the Atlantic Monthly, New York Times Magazine, Wall Street Journal, American Poetry Review, and others. And um, uh, on a sort of personal level, uh, Gordon's, um, Professor Marino's also has a, um, a history and of a career of being a boxing coach, uh, and that informs much of what he does, and a, and a football coach and a football player, um, you know, at once way back when. And, um, and one more fun connection for those of you who do know Anselm House well and are, um, are sort of familiar with our programming, uh, Paul Holmer, who is um, one of the, the sort of founding faculty members at the university uh, related to Anselm House, and the namesake for the Homer Lecture in the Humanities that we put on every year was an academic mentor uh, for Professor Marino. Uh, and so that's a really, really fun connection as well. So with all that said, uh, Professor Marino, uh, we're just really excited that you're here and um, yeah, welcome. Thanks so much, Travis. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I've been trying to get together for a long time and uh, especially uh, it's a special, special uh, to me that it's um, uh, the connection with Paul Homer, who was such a generous and individual and a, a real model of what it is to be a Christian, and I think in a Kierkegaardian sense. So I'm really happy to be here and join you. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we'll be talking about anxiety, despair, and depression. Uh, some happy topics for the spring. Um, and uh, 
uh, start out with just saying that you know, through, all, through all the breakthroughs in neuroscience, et cetera, all the um, emphasis on mental health, um, according to some, as many as one in seven Americans are on psychotropic drugs. So it's, 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 it's as though uh, for all the emphasis on mental health, it's not as though we're getting much, much better. And uh, I think Kierkegaard uh, provides a little different vocabulary uh, for looking at the landscape of inner lives or thinking about our inner lives. So, um, I think he'd be great, he's great to bring into uh, um, dialogue with um, his, his current views of, uh, uh, of our mental, uh, mental health. Um, uh, the boy, he was born in 18, 1813, lived 1855, and is usually considered the, fa the father of provenance of existentialism. But uh, um, most important to me, he was the first one to really take moods seriously. Um, a trouble, as a troubled young man, it seemed attracted, I was attracted to him because it seemed to me that in order to be a decent person, we not only had to overcome external obstacles, we have to overcome internal obstacles. And some of us uh, had a, have a lot more than others than that. So uh, I really appreciated his, his, um, his attempt to tackle and to think about the meaning of, of these inner states, anxiety and, and uh, depression and despair. After all, it should be easy for a person when uh, all the lights are green, everything's going well to be, to be good, you know, to be nice. I see people have success, so they're very friendly and everything. But the question is, can we do it when uh, we get the jolts of existence, when, when things get rough and uh, they will get rough <laughs> enough times and uh, to be able to sit with that, uh, to be able to reach through emotions, painful emotions, not to numb up, to be able to reach through and be a loving person, even though you're anxious or you're just in, uh, in depressed. Um, so that's one of the things that really attracted I, had a, I was a troubled, sometimes troubling kid. And uh, uh, I, well, that's one of the reasons I was attracted to Kierkegaard. Um, there was a long standing, uh, you know, he, again, he never, he really didn't classify himself as a philosopher. He was very uh, hostile to academic philosophy, actually. But um, in, in terms of philosophy, there's a long-standing view going back to Socrates, rationalist and stuff that the emotions just get in the way of uh, of reason, right? That uh, in fact, when Socrates is about to be executed, he's he's talking about, oh, I can't wait to be free of the body because it's a body that gives rise to emotions, and emotions cloud the mind, right? So it's as though this, you know, they're they're the antithesis of reason, and um, Kierkegaard was quick to point out in his book, The Concept of Anxiety, that there's a cognitive content to anxiety. That anxiety has a cognitive content that moves, teaches something. In fact, on his reckoning, anxiety, it's in anxiety that we come to understand that we're free, and only in anxiety, right? So anxiety, it's in anxiety that we come to understand our freedom, what it means to be free. And uh, uh, so, uh, he said, he, he said, more than that, he said, he, he would say at certain places in this book, which is his most difficult book and written by a pseudonym, Agilius Hafniensis, uh, he would say that uh, uh, beasts and angels don't have anxiety. It's anxiety that makes human beings spirits, right? That's the freedom, the freedom, right? So uh, again, it's a, he has this positive spin on it. Okay? So it's got a cognitive, it's just very, just some, just some very quick, important points about anxiety uh, that, again, it's got cognitive content. It's not a bad thing. He would say it's, it's, it's not a bad thing, but he recognized how dangerous it is. I mean, he recognized how dangerous it is uh, that some people could work out, could deal with their anxiety in very destructive ways. He knew that. And he was a very anxious individual himself in some of his journals. He talks as a young man about committing suicide and things like that. So he recognizes danger, but he said, it's really that which makes us spirits. Uh, another, and, uh, in fact, he says in, in this uh, constant anxiety, to learn to be anxious in the right way is the ultimate, right? So he says, this last chapter of this book written in 1844, he writes, I will say that this is an adventure that every human being must go through. That is anxiety, right? To learn to be anxious in order that he may not perish either by never having been in anxiety or by succumbing in anxiety, right? 
uh, to, to learn to be anxious in order that he may not perish, either by never having been in anxiety or by su succumbing in anxiety. Whoever has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. Whoever learns to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. Now that's quite different than our current views of that. Anxiety is something that just gets in the way of functioning or, or whatever, right? That we need to learn to be anxious. We need to be able, learn to be able to sit with it, these feelings. And in our culture, there's a lot of emphasis, get rid of them as fast as, can, as, you, as you can. They just get in the way of happiness and our ability to be success, successful. No, he says we need to be anxious in the, and, and to learn to be anxious in the right way is the ultimate lesson in life. That's pretty strong. And, and I think to some extent he meant that to learn to be anxious about the right things, to learn to be anxious about what kind of human being you are is the ultimate lesson in life, is, is, is what he's talking, what he's really referring to. Right, to really be, to, uh, he always had this view that uh, 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 to be courageous, it takes one one fear has to drive out another. So, for example, imagine you could do something that that uh, would make you would help you realize some vocational dream, but it would require doing something untoward. And he would say, well, you need to be more afraid, and more anxious about being a jerk than about not becoming a big shot or whatever. Right. So those are the three things about anxiety. I just out of many points he makes about him, right? Um, let's talk about uh, depression, despair a little bit. And the main point I wanna talk about here with depression and despair is that uh, he's gonna draw a distinction that I think we've lost today between these two, two things. And also a distinction between a psychological illness or malady and a spiritual malady, right? I mean, a lot of people talk about the spirit today and all this stuff, but they, they don't seem to see a distinction between a spiritual and a psychological affliction. And I think we can find that in, in Kierkegaard. I'm gonna just read a little bit here. Uh, Kierkegaard uh, was called the fork as a child because of his uncanny ability to find people's weaknesses and stick it to them. He was gaffed them, he was called. Um, he was bullied all the time, beat up all the time. And it, it's so ironic because he was a, he was a the fork in, in Christendom. I mean, he uh, attacked uh, Christendom and, uh, uh, and the Danish church ultimately and was always, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic that he was called the fork, right? His lapidary sickness on a death. So this, uh, this is a book he wrote in 1848, came out in 1849. And um, it's his, I think his greatest work written under the pseudonym Anticlimicus. And if I were to recommend one book, it would be this, The Sickness on a Death. It's a study of despair in which in which the Danish, uh, a study of despair, and the Danish word for despair, for Vivalsa, derives from the notion of self-intensified doubt, right? It's, not, it's a word that, it's, uh, unlike ours, is not connected with hopelessness, but intensified doubt. Almost as a challenge to keep out the less than earnest reader, Kierkegaard begins sickness with his famous, albeit slightly ironic bit of wordplay. And this always gets, gets my students. Okay, here it is. It's a human being is a spirit, but what is the spirit? Spirit is the self. But what is the self? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself, or is the relation relating itself to itself in the relation? And a lot of people just, that's like a fence you got to get past to get through this book. But a lot of, you know, I, when I teach this in class, students are always drawing graphs. So I'll read it one more time. A human being is a spirit, but what is the spirit? Spirit is the self, but what is the self? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself, or is the, or is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation. So, um, for those who do not immediately pitch the book across the room, Kierkegaard continues, the human being is a synthesis of the infinite and finite, temporal and eternal, and freedom and necessity. So as he defines despair in this book uh, in three different ways. First, he says it's an imbalance in the we have these two aspects of the self, the eternal and the temporal, but the finite and the infinite, right? Uh, human beings all have these aspects and despair is an imbalance and the one, an imbalance. Second definition, it's in terms of your gradations of self, of consciousness of being a self. So to be in despair, we're gonna see for him is to be ignorant of being a self, right? To be ignorant of being a self to, uh, or, or uh, to have an idea of yourself and refuse, to, to want to create yourself, to be your own father, as he sometimes says, right? Which is another kind. So for, for Kierkegaard, despair uh, 
uh, is on this continuum between weakness, complete ignorance of being a self, and I don't know what that means, and all this kind of stuff, or give me a theory, right, versus someone who, uh, who would have a very strong idea of what is the self, but wants to be, make themselves, right? So, um, the spirit occurs when there's, there's an imbalance in the synthesis. From there, Kierkegaard goes on to present a veritable portrait rally of the forms that despair can take, almost like the, uh, the DSM. It's a spiritual portrait gallery of uh, what it's like if you have too much infinitude, like uh, people who are dreamers and can never make anything concrete. On the other hand, you have people that are, are so concrete they have no vision, right? So he gives us a tremendous, terrific portrait gallery of this, of, 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 of the despair as an imbalance. Too much of the expansive fact of infinitude, and you have the dreamer who cannot make anything concrete. Too much of the limiting element, and you have the narrow minded individual who cannot imagine anything more serious in life than bottom lines and spreadsheets, right? My students who come to St. Olaf and uh, liberal arts school, and from the first day, they just want to be actuaries or something. You know, that's no, don't want to hear anything about philosophy or this kind of stuff. They just seem to, they seem to get concrete. Despair, according to Kierkegaard, this is really important, is a lack of awareness of being a self or spirit, right? That's what it is, to be unaware that you have, that you're the spiritual enemy, that you have a self, right? And that's quite different than depression. A Freud with religious categories up the sleeves, Kierkegaard emphasized that the self is a slice of eternity, it's an eternal element. While depression involves heavy burdens and feelings, Right? Despair is, is not correlated with any particular set of emotions. Right? So there's no, uh, he's, he's given us quite a different view of despair. It's not connected with any feelings. You can be happy and be in despair because you can be ignorant of being a self. Right? But it's instead marked by a desire to get rid of the self or put another way by an unwillingness to become who you fundamentally are. Right? The unwillingness often takes the form of the flat out wanting to be someone else, wanting to be someone else. Kierkegaard writes, an individual in despair despairs over something. So it seems for a moment, but only for a moment. In the same moment, the true despair or despair in its true form shows itself. In despairing over something, he really despaired over himself and now wants to be rid of himself, right? In despairing over something, he really despaired of himself and now wants to be rid of himself. For example, when the ambitious man whose slogan is, is either Caesar or nothing does not get to be Caesar, he despairs over it. Precisely because he did not get to be Caesar, he cannot bear to be himself. So uh, in my own life, I was a college football player and all I cared about was trying to make it to the NFL. When that didn't happen, I couldn't. I couldn't stand my, I didn't want to be myself anymore. I couldn't stand myself. It was like uh, being stuck on a bus with some drunk cleaner and on you the whole time, or whatever, you know? I, I, and and I, turned, I turned to alcohol, I turned to substance abuse. But here despair is this, uh, the, the, the person, this is a case where you have de depression and despair. The person doesn't want to be who they are. They can't stand being themselves, can't stand being themselves unless they have some badge or some, you know, uh, some, some, some uh, there's, they have an ideal self. They can't realize that they don't want to be themselves. Got it? It's pretty. It's pretty cool. It's a really interesting uh, um, uh, insight into de into depression. I think here, right? But this th this individual doesn't realize that the real test is to become the human being that the spirit that God uh, wanted you to be. Right? The real self is something deeper than that. Uh, in America, there's endless talk of the importance of having a dream. That is a dreamed up self that you will be become a millionaire, a surgeon, an author or whatever. Uh, but master of suspicion that Kierkegaard was, he goes on to note that while the man who has failed to become Caesar would have been in seventh heaven if he had realized his dream, that state would have been just as despairing in another way. Because in that giddy self-satisfied condition, he would never have come to grasp his true self. So it's as though Kierkegaard believed, so uh, yeah, three different selves, the, the concrete self, this ideal self of me wanting to be in the NFL, and then the self you were meant to be, God created the self. And suppose that's something like a loving human being, a good loving human being. And he says that 
the person who becomes the big shot oftentimes forgets forgets about uh, the self that God wanted them to be, right? They're, they're always patted on the back. They may be rich, they're famous. Never think about, they lose complete. They're as much in despair as the person who's depressed, right? Because they don't think about the self they were meant to be. And uh, that's one of my classes I, I, I used to at least uh, emphasize so much that uh, during college, you, know, you want to think about not just about what your vocation you're going to have, but what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of human being do you want to be? And, uh, and, and that's, the, that's, the real, that's the real self. And so Kierkegaard thinks you, could, you can fall into despair, this ignorance of being a self, both by getting depressed and hating yourself, and also by just um, forgetting yourself in success, happiness, fortune, whatever. Uh, on the issue of depression, which Kierkegaard and his entire family were very well acquainted with, I mean, Kierkegaard was uh, this is a long story about his uh, uh, when he got uh, uh, he was going to marry, engaged, he was engaged to Regina Olson and broke it off, and because one of the reasons he gave once was because he was such a, he was so depressive and his family was so filled with depression. His brother ended up was a bishop, ended up in the institution, and um, so Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard suffered from terribly. Right? He seems to have recognized that we could be born into the blues. In 1846, he sighed, I'm in the profoundest sense an unhappy individuality, riveted from the beginning to one or another suffering, bordering on madness. On uh, um, a suffering which must have its basis in a misrelation between my mind and body. For, and this is the remarkable thing, as well as my infinite encouragement, it has no relation to my spirit, which on the contrary, because of the tension between my mind and body has gained an uncommon resiliency. So here he's saying that um, even though he's he's been depressed his whole life, and was, was always dealing with this, and he kind of attributed it to, to his father. And there's a number of quotes where it's clear that it's, you know, one time he thanks us, this is something therapists like, he thanks his father for, uh, he says, my father's ruled my prospects for happiness, but he prepared me for for faith, right? But no, he just destroyed his chances of being a happy, happy individual. Um, and uh, so uh, you get you get this distinction of him. He, and it's interesting because he he says he never prays. He prays for everything, but he never prays to be relieved of this depression, which he uh, calls his thorn in the side. The spirit is one thing; the psyche another. The blue is one thing, despair another. How might Kierkegaard have parsed out the distinction for the doubting Thomas who will only believe what he can glean on an MRI? Perhaps he would describe it this way. Each of us is subject to the weather of our, of our own moods. Right? Each of us is subject to moods are like an internal kind of weather. Clearly Kierkegaard thought that the darkling sky of his inner life was very much due to his father's morbidity. But the issue of spiritual health looms up with regard to the way we relate to our emotional lives. Do you give up on yourself? Do you, do you, you know, so it's as though it's a, this meta relationship. To, it's how we, uh, for example, when you're depressed, can you be kind? Can you reach through that? Can you, or, or do you just say uh, to, uh, uh, I, it's hopeless, I'm, 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 uh, it's just hopeless. So uh, I think the idea of despair has a, and, and faith, which go together for him, have a lot to do with our relationship to our, our emotions and aren't determined by them. Uh, again, for Kierkegaard, despair is not, not a feeling, but an attitude, a posture towards ourselves. The man who did not become Caesar, the applicant refused by medical school, all experienced profound disappointment, but the spiritual travails, travails only begin when the chagrin consumes the awareness that we are something more than our emotions and projects. Again, when we, we can think of despair, if you want to think of it from a secular point of view, giving up on, on being a certain kind of human being. Right, Give up on yourself. Uh, does the depressive identify himself completely with his melancholy? Has a never ending bl a blizzard of inexplicable sad thoughts caused him to give up on himself and to see his suffering as a kind of fever without any significance? Right, which you could say that a modernity we're encouraged to think of it that way. It's a it's, it's an ill, it's a, a mental illness, sort of, right? So, right? so Kierkegaard would bid him to consider a spiritual consolation on a consultation on his despair to go along with his trip to the mental health clinic. 
But the important thing is the distinction we get from him about the, about the between, between despair and depression, and just depression being a certain feeling, despair being this lack of awareness of being a self, which I think we've lost in our, our society. Um, so I'll stop there. That's great. Uh, thank you, Professor Marino. I'm going to make one quick um, change to the uh, to the plan here. I have I have a list of questions, but I'm going to limit myself so that people can get their questions in. I maybe I'll ask one or two. But if you're watching and you you can feel free to put your question in the Q and A. But also, um, if you'd like to click the raise hand button, um, we can select you uh, to deliver your question to Professor Marino. Um, you know, uh, through your microphone, we can enable your microphone so you can go ahead and ask your question and live. So um, feel free to raise your hand uh, if you have a question that you'd like to offer to Dr. Marino. And um, in the meantime, uh, just two things that maybe I wonder if you might pick up on. Um, one question I was thinking about uh, as, I, as I read your book um, was, you know, Kierkegaard is often treated as simply like a proto even proto existentialist, um, sort of the font of the existentialist tradition and often read in light of those who came after him, many of whom were not Christian or, or in some ways against Christianity. Um, I wonder if you might just help us understand a little bit about Kierkegaard's faith. Uh, what kind of Christian faith did he have? Um, how would you describe his, his sort of spirituality and his theology for us? Mm, okay, thanks. Um, uh, good question. I mean, so one of the reasons he's connected with existentialism as much as the, just the themes he, he lays out, I mean, choice, freedom, uh, moods, uh, uh, things like that, contingency in life, and um, uh, the meaning of life, you know, he's raising that kind of question. But in terms of his own spirituality, uh, I think he, he believed that to follow Christ is to try to follow Christ, the imitation of Christ. And if we don't do that, then it's just a bunch of uh, talk, country club. Mm -hmm. in which we which we can live like uh, which we can live like everybody else and also pat ourselves in the back for being spiritual right so he was really a, a, and, and, and even at the end of his life with the attack on Christendom on the Lutheran church he sat in, sat in cafes on Sunday which was illegal and um, said I'm not going to participate in making a fool of God but that to be a Christian and his whole life was a meditation on faith that's why I think anybody who's really for whom faith is really a is, is your parent question? He's a really good walking companion because he, um, he, um, he, 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 his whole life was at meditation. And one of the, another thing about him is he thought that uh, faith had to go together with this possibility of offense. That any kind of religiosity, that offense being like something that pushes you away. That's why if you read Fear and Trembling, the idea that God would tell Abraham to kill his son. That. Uh, um, that there's an offensive element to Christianity. You can't get to, to faith. You can't get to it through, through syllogisms, right? And uh, that's something we, we, that's not very well appreciated today. And uh, so faith in this idea, and then Jesus would go around and he'd say, don't be offended at me. Don't be offended at me. And so um, I hope that's some help. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, another uh, question that I was thinking about um, specifically related to anxiety and depression um, you talk about in your book a little bit about the historical circumstances and conditions that gave rise to existentialism, you know, thinking in sort of the early 20th century and some of the historical events that were going on and some of the social conditions. And it made me wonder about the, the sort of relationship between the, the individual and the social components of phenomena like anxiety or depression. Um, you mentioned in the book, you know, Auden's poem, Age of Anxiety, sort of, uh, you know, defining the era. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether there might be sort of grounds for a social understanding of anxiety and depression within Kierkegaard's thought, because he's also often thought about as sort of like, you know, mediating the individual's sort of mm -hmm. relation to God. And so, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the sort of social aspects of de depression and anxiety. Yeah, I talk about, yeah thanks, Dr. Travis. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, he's uh, one of the reasons he's an existentialist is emphasis on the individual, trying to pull, pull the individual out from the crowd. It was a time of mass movements, which he took issue with. It's very 
uh, not, not very popular with Kierkegaard. But one of the things that one of a great insight of his into human nature is he thinks we're really obsessed with comparison. We can't give it up, right? Comparing mm -hmm. ourselves to others, right? And that, that um, just he's, he even jokes about it. Um, saying he has this, I think it's in Works of Love, where he talks about uh, the rich man wants to, you know, gets the big, big plot in the, in the, in the cemetery, he puts the fence around it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so this this kind of uh, uh, obsessiveness with comparison, and even he, he even teases himself a little bit. Sometimes he'll go through these uh, tremendous uh, intellectual gym, gymnastic uh, moves, and he'll say, "But the person who can arrive at this conclusion about faith, but without all this stuff, is I'm no better than that person, even though I might be tempted to." So I think, I'm, and and there's so much of that in our society today about comparison. So much social media and TV, celebrity culture. All that stuff, uh, you know. Uh, I think he would say that that can get to us. And the, and the, so the person who defines himself uh, in terms of the group or whatever, they they be like someone who um, defended against their insecurity by trying to become part of a group or part. Of the, so that would be a, a, um, a spiritually pathological way of dealing with your anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than being anxi anxious about what you should be, this person tries to quell their anxiety by clinging to finitude. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't be an NFL player, so my father's not going to love me anymore. So, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think the comparison thing is really a great insight on his part. And he was, and he was an individual who took umbrage very easily. I mean, he was, he was, he was angry at that, but but was highly aware of that, right? And he yeah. thought it was. Um, reminds, so me of, um, reminds me of. Uh, reminds me of Heidegger, who probably got it from Kierkegaard, but talking about Das Mann <laughs> and, and the they and. Yeah sort of living in light of the the sort of social consciousness right but here the but but here the idea would be just needing to compare yourself mm -hmm. or is it better than someone else you know? yeah yeah um so i've got a couple of questions rolling in um the first one is about uh Kierkegaard's definition of anxiety um and the person is wondering uh whether Kierkegaard is talking about something different or something similar to what say Paul uh, and Jesus might be talking about in scriptures when they're telling people not to be anxious. Um, oh, Jesus, yeah. Yeah, so, so how would you sort of compare those two sort of concepts of anxiety? I think there'd be a good deal of overlapping when Jesus says, don't be anxious about today, whatever that, that one, that, that quote, I think it's from John or whatever. So I, I think there's a good deal of overlap. And, and I, I also think there's a lot of overlap with how people think about anxiety today. That's why I think he really offers a, a fresh vocabulary for us. It's not like he didn't have any idea of what we would call anxiety. They'd be surprised by that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think there's a good deal of overlap. Mm -hmm. And he always says, uh, for example, uh, for example, if you read his religious discourses about anxiety, is always about tomorrow, right? Or, or the, the one about the uh, the bird and the the uh, lilies of the field and birds of the air, right? right? They don't feel anxious. Yeah. So I, I think uh, I think I think it'd be a good deal of overlap. Uh, another question um, somebody's asked uh, about your concept of despair uh, being related to the sort of rending apart of identity and the ignorance of being a self. Uh, and the person's wondering whether Kierkegaard presents a solution for these people who are in despair. Uh, is it uh, simply that an interest in understanding or facing themselves must somehow be awakened in them? Or, you know, so sort of what are the, mm. the mechanics of that change in getting out of despair? Oh, well, that's a good question. But uh, Kierkegaard doesn't offer much in the, uh, uh, in the way of um, mechanics of or, or self engineering we're into today, or mm -hmm. six steps to getting out of despair. And again, so this book, The Sickness on Death, is written by as high a pseudonym, Anti Climacus. And Kierkegaard originally signed his name to the book and then said, Well, I don't really live up to these ideals, so I can't. So I, he wrote it in the name of a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. But for him, it would be important to talk about the impediments to understanding yourself. And, and he thinks that one of the, the one of the primary impediments is that to understand that you're self, I mean, suppose you think of yourself as, uh, well, to be really, uh, to, be a, to be a spirit, to be a self is to be a loving servant, a person, a person like that. Well, that's gonna involve a lot of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And he says, we don't want that. So we talk ourselves out of it endlessly. Right, so, and I think, got this, you know what I mean? So it's, one of the impediments is it's going to lead to sacrifice. It's going to bring you into conflict with the world, mm -hmm. right? 
it's going to bring you into conflict with the world. He says, if it's not, if the world's patting you on your back, you're going in the wrong direction spiritually. But so, and I think one of his greatest insights, at least from an, an ethics, and somebody I think is his, is his analysis of self-deception. Hmm. All right. So uh, 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 he says like what we'd like to do when we're faced with uh, some choice that's difficult and, and we say, oh, we'll always jump out of the closet. Well, we'll think about it till tomorrow. He says, by tomorrow, you'll figure out the easy way is the right way. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the impediments. Well, one of the reasons we don't want to become ourselves is it's not cool. It's not, it's not like uh, becoming rich and famous or something, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing that cool about it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of doing a conflict. Thankless, thankless task in some ways. In some ways. Yeah. yeah. But it might give you a piece that's your path is understanding. <laughs> that's right. Um, so uh, Tom asks if you could say a little bit more about spirituality being how we relate to our emotions. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. That's yeah. Um, so I I care. So and this goes back to your question, Trev, um, about his understanding of faith. He's he didn't think you could ever like. Well, uh, now I'm a Christian. That's the end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been born again. That's it. That constant being, being a Christian was a, a constant uh, striving, right? Uh, a constant striving. So um, the question I I think. So at times when I'm like, oh man, it can't be a God, you gotta be kidding me. Like sometimes I've gone through rough times and I'll just pray to, pray to Jesus, man, just give me a hand, just help me be patient. I'm wife's been sick, she's been other. And Jesus, you know, he doesn't give me any help at all, you know? And so I'm like, part of me is like, oh, forget this stuff, right? Uh, so he would say, it's how you, the question at that point is, okay, do you wanna, do you keep praying and wanna have faith? Or do you want to say, good, put faith, faith to bed, right? So uh, you get with these moods go through us and they invite us to go, they might invite us to say, this is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. right? And so I, I think of faith as this kind of, met and, and despair, uh, is this relationship to our moods. I mean, suppose like, if somebody who's, like Lincoln, I was thinking, like, here's a guy who's, I mean, everybody's, I mean, his, son's not, his son dies, his civil war, a horrible background. They had to hide instruments from him so he didn't kill himself all the time. Is suicidal. So at uh, one level, he's depressed, right? But he doesn't give in to that depression. Doesn't, at least in the, in the sense, he doesn't doesn't let him uh, take him away from his project of uh, being a, per a certain kind of person, a loving person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. Now I, I would also say that in our society today, there's there's this idea we just need to change these, these moods, these emotions, right? Mm -hmm. well, however. You know, doesn't doesn't encourage us to learn to sit with them or, or to, uh, to you know. Um, so, I think that's antithetical to what people had in mind. But yeah, that was one of my questions. Kind of had to do with that, and you just touched on it. But if, if you want to elaborate, you can. Um, it's basically, what would Kierkegaard say to somebody, a believer or a person of faith who was worried that because they experience acute anxiety or depression, that their faith must not be real? Or legitimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because they experience anxiety, they they they, they were were a person of faith. Yeah, and I'm thinking yeah. particularly about sort of maybe in modern times, a lot of people hold the view that um, you know uh, that that faith is somehow sort of therapeutic, um, and that it it would be incompatible with uh, with doubt. Yeah. Um, or with, you know, um, at least with depression, um, maybe. And, and so maybe I, maybe people don't necessarily articulate that, but I think some people carry around that. Yeah, yeah. and I think he saw that in his family with both his father and his brother tortured themselves to death, right? Even though, so Kierkegaard emphasizes in the last, second half of the sickness under death, the spirit is defined as sin, and understanding that as self is you're in sin before God. So he's, it's pretty strong on that on that note, but that wouldn't. But the issue there would be to accept your weakness, right? To accept to to uh, to uh, turn to God for forgiveness or whatever, but not to torture yourself. I think you probably see that, which uh, as 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 the wrong way to deal with it, right? Hmm. As a misunderstanding of what faith is, because people of faith are going to have anxiety. I mean, that is what is the view of being. It's, again, it's not all you know. He, you don't become a Christian, that's the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> On his account, right? So, 
anxiety is part of what is the human. Um, so Joseph is asking about um, the relationship between Kierkegaard's understanding of Christian faith of the individual and uh, other sort of conceptions of the church as a community of Christian believers. Um, he mentioned Bonhoeffer in particular, um, but it maybe um, an invitation to talk about Kierkegaard's understanding of the church and its relation to some of these questions. Yeah, not this, I'm not, not so strong on that, but uh, so uh, um, he was a critic of the church, but he certainly didn't want, want, want to destroy it. He just wanted it to be, he wanted uh, people to be honest about what it was. He says, it's not about being power and all this. Um, uh, so he was, he was a critic, but certainly wasn't one who wanted to destroy it, you know, so. But I, I can't say too much more than that. Um, There's no sense of sort of distinct goods that the, the church offers to the individual. Yeah, that, that, I, I, well, he doesn't think one person can give another person faith. That's one issue. We mm -hmm. can build each other up. We can re help remove obstacles, right? Uh, and, and he thought in his time, people would go to church and they really didn't believe anyhow. There was no sacrifice. It was just a, a club. They actually thought it was kind of silly. You know, and mm -hmm. he thought people should just be honest, mm -hmm. right? Really decide, decide, believe it or not, right? He, he says this. He says that. He says that's especially true of the educated and rich. They mm -hmm. they pretend like they they actually say this is, they actually think it's funny, and you know, but at the same time they'll be there. Um, but he never, so far as I can see, he, he never got to the point where he was able to articulate what a what a healthy kind of church would would be. You know, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Uh, I didn't get rid of it. Um, we've got a question here. It's it's uh, basically asking for your interpretation of a, of a quotation from Kierkegaard. So I'll, I'll read the quotation um, and you can tell is us. Is this what a quiz show? Is this a quiz show? <laughs> yeah, right. Quiz show? Yeah. Uh, you get five seconds. Go. Uh, no. It, it, so here's the quotation. In relating itself to itself and in willing itself to be itself, the self rests transparently in the power that established it. Right, beautiful quote. That, thank you. That's a, that's his, that algebra. That's Antiochus's algebraic formula for faith. That faith is this activity of resting transparently in God. Mm. Of, it's, it's both an activity and a resting, mm. right? With self, with self conscious about it. So that's what's kind of it's what I love about that passage is this idea. Of this activity of resting, I, that's why I think for, for Kierkegaard and Danish that for his troll uh, is uh, faith is more of a trust. Are you going to trust in God or not? Mm -hmm. Right, and so that's what, and that that the quote that this person picked out, this excellent quote, is a uh, is one that comes a page after the one I read that everyone puzzles, scratches mm -hmm. their head over, but uh, I, I think it's trusting in God. So one of the questions I had earlier had to do with um, what what does faith um, offer in terms of um, the experience of anxiety or depression? Um, I'm thinking about those who are experiencing them maybe right now um, and and puzzling over sort of what what faith uh, how it might affect anxiety or depression. And so so maybe it'd be I know that. From what I'm hearing you say, there there may not be any sort of simple solutionizing, you know, to getting rid of it. Um, but the the issue of trust seems like it potentially might um, help you at least from falling into despair. Yeah, they should trust that the life is good, and that's a big thing with them. The trust, not not the t-shirt either, right? That life is good. Uh, the, and and for me, it seems that he, he draws this distinction between. Um, uh, joy and happiness uh, were, you know, and, and some of the martyrs, the joyful, the, 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 this acceptance, this peacefulness, right? Mm. Uh, as opposed to hey, I'm feeling good, uh, which comes and goes, he thinks, right? So it it, it, it can be a, a bomb in that sense. It can it can be can be, uh, but I wouldn't think of it as, as therapy. Um, but um, he said, yeah, yeah. Could be reassured, should be reassured that God that, that that God's there that life is good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and loves Absolutely. us. Yeah. So 
Leif has asked whether there's a connection between despair and anxiety and Kierkegaard and uh, John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. And he has a follow-up question. Would you say Kierkegaard would be upset that we're allowed to pose questions as anonymous attendees? <laughs> yeah, anonymity is not something he liked. I don't think he'd like uh, uh, so <laughs> Twitter and some of these things, uh, yeah. Um, uh, in terms of the dark night of the soul, I'm not I'm not that, that familiar with it, but uh, he's often connected with the idea of being able to go through suffering and hold on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that suffering that suffering teaches us vulnerability, uh, that it you go, we have to go through this feeling of being lost, basically a lot. So he, he seemed to feel that way, yeah, yeah. That, that times of uh, mm -hmm. when we feel when uh, terrible, and um, that's what that's what I'm contending. So I think. In modern terms, of a, the dark night of the soul is depression. Well, Kierkegaard's claiming we've got to be able to, the, the, A, it can teach us something, namely vulnerability and our, and our need for God, um, but also something we go, that uh, we need to go through. Yeah. Is there a sense in which um, sort of, uh, I'm trying to think about the sort of, um, philosophical approach to depression and anxiety and the pharmaceutical or the medical approach. Um, it seems to me that there's maybe a sense in which the, the medical or pharmaceutical might short circuit some of the dynamics that you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that, that question, that's, thanks, Trevor. That, that comes up quite a bit is, oh, Kierkegaard to think about medication too, and that kind of a thing. And I don't think there'd be a problem with people taking it in, in, uh, in, in danger or or whatever, but I, I think uh, the overuse of it is, uh, has um, diminished our ability to sit with anxiety and, and bad feelings. Uh, and uh, the fact that we can, the fact that we can, uh, that we can say, give some causal mechanisms for certain feelings doesn't explain the meaning of those feelings. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would like to draw a distinction between the cause and the meaning. So people seem to think, well, if some part of the brain is lighting up, that explains the, the ideas you're having when, uh, you know, when you're depressed or whatever, and, and I, I think that's a, a misnomer. But I, 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 I think I, I do think current views towards psychiatry are, to a very large extent, undermining our sense of agency. I, um, I think we're good. My friend Joe Davis, who my, he, he thinks we've got to the age of uh, anxiety, the age of panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I have mean, people in class tell me all the time, "I'm having a panic attack." It's like, you know, like it was anxiety before, now it's panic attacks. So. Uh, it might have diminished our ability to deal with pain, mm -hmm. and that sense can be very can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really. And our ability, and if we can't deal with pain, we can't be compassionate to other people, right? If we're consumed by anxiety about, you know, you know what I mean. So I, I think you'd be you'd be really a little bit disappointed in that in that. You know, well, and then, and then the claim that we don't really need to think about what's going on too—that often goes along with it. When I teach Freud too, and I have a lot, a lot of students, so I want to just take some medication. You know, why should I think about what I'm feeling? Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, it diminishes our sense of agency and, can, and gives us a sense that we don't really need to think about the meaning of the content of our thoughts. Mm. It's, really, it's really helpful. Um, I see that we have an attendee who's raised their hand. So um, I'm going to allow, I'm going to invite David to ask his question and just ask that you follow Anselm House rules, which is um, keep it short, keep it respectful, and keep it a question. So uh, <laughs> that, uh, I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to allow David to talk. David, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Thank you, for, uh, Dr. Marino. Um, I wanted to ask. Uh, I wanted to ask about the my interpretation of what you presented as the distinction between an ideal self and a self um, seems to cast the idea. At least my interpretation seems to cast the ideal self in somewhat of a negative light. So I wanted to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the so I, I've read existentialists. I haven't read Kierkegaard. So maybe there's some clarification here. But an ideal self. Um, I could also, I could associate that maybe with like goals I might set for myself or aspirations that you might have. 
Um, and certainly working towards those seems to be maybe an antidote to uh, some, some negative feelings you have. Um, at the same time, I realized you can like become some Tyler Durden like character and that can bring you towards some negative end as well. Um, is, I guess, why am I correct in thinking that this ideal self is, um, is a painful, a painful delusion? And if so, um, how, how can we identify, how can we distinguish what is the true and what is the ideal? Right, so that's yeah, a really good question. Yeah, this comes up with, yeah. Uh, so uh, here, there's nothing um, wrong with the ideal self. You have uh, a desire for, in his case, to be a writer or whatever. Or, uh, those things are perfectly legitimate. But when you become, when your whole sense of identity uh, becomes dependent on that, which often happens. I mean, I have students who are obsessed with oh, yeah, med school or whatever, you know, just can't, can't love themselves unless they realize the self. Kierkegaard would say that's a problem. Right, I mean, that's, that's the idea, but he said there's nothing, you should have some uh, sense of vocation and, uh, and uh, yeah, desire to, to, to develop your talents. Uh, but in our society, uh, it, we're, there's also an invitation that when it doesn't work out, um, it, it can, people can begin to hate themselves. And I hear a lot of people a lot of time when they're successful, oh, thank God, thank God. You know, all that, as though, you know, as though they're really saying in effect, I've been blessed by God. You know, like what, what is, what's the person say uh, who, uh, you know, things don't go well for or has to, can't chase a dream because they got to work on a farm and feed their kids or whatever. So, uh, but yeah, so he, he doesn't think there's anything, um, it would be a misrelation to the ideal self that would be dangerous. You forget, your real task in life, right? Which is, which again for him would be to realize your equality before God, and be a loving person, All right? Thanks for the question, that's good. Yeah, that was a good question. Um, another one here in the, the comments that I think is interesting it has to do with thinking about the, the social conditions under which Kierkegaard was writing in sort of the, the early modern period. Um, this person asks, uh, to what extent are anxiety and maybe depression and despair, um, do they come with increased freedom uh, about one's life and mm. motivation? Uh, was Kierkegaard wrestling with this sort of expansion of choice? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So how does that yeah. sort of play out? These are some of the best, this is tough questions, man. These are good. <laughs> yeah, you're right. He doesn't think about the social aspect that much, except you're right, There's, this is a time when, um, uh, uh, of uh, great social mobility, the beginning of um, mass media uh, in, Denmark, in Denmark and over Europe. So yeah, it could it could very and, and a, uh, an opportunity, an invitation again to compare yourself with others. Yeah, so uh, I, I think he ignores that. He, he doesn't talk about that. For him. He doesn't address that. Hmm. And maybe he should have. I don't know. Great. Um... Another question. We have time for a few more. So if you want to get them in, go ahead and drop them in to the Q&A or raise your hand. We can make a multiple choice questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, fill in the blank. Uh, so Carl's asked, uh, what might it look like to rest transparently in anticlimacuses sense? Um, would we be able to recognize someone who was doing this if we met them? If not, uh, yeah. would such a person be anonymous in a sense? Yeah, so another one of his big themes is um, uh, anti-Hegelian, -Hege this claim that um, the inner and outer are uh, incommensurable. So a lot of his heroes are look like a, are just ordinary, not a lot of them, but the, the couple of times he paints an individual of faith, it's just a bourgeois type guy or something or a woman. And um, so he doesn't think we could tell, you could see that, that you can't tell a, per a person could be a spiritual giant and just a, just an everyday person. So he'd say they were incommensurable. Mm -hmm. He says that all the time, from mm -hmm. beginning to end of his authorship, right? So this idea that someone could be really spiritually together and yet not be, I don't know, the mayors, I don't know, you know what I mean? Not be, not a real, not, not be Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, let's see here. I think we just got one more in here. Um, so Emily's asked about, uh, she says there's huge cultural differences and gender differences in terms of depression. 
individualistic culture has much higher depression level than more collectivist cultures. Uh, men have three to four times higher suicide rates than women. Do you think individualist culture and men should learn from the relational wisdom from collectivist culture and women to combat depression? Well, I mean, I've done some, done some studies of uh, cross-cultural psych, psych, uh, psychopathology and uh, collectivist cultures have some of their own problems too. So um, yeah, uh, um, but I, I, I think the, certainly the, uh, this need to um, realize this ideal self, this kind of push, this dream self, all this, a bit person, you have to have a vision you're chasing all the time, you know, mm -hmm. so is, a, is something we could, uh, Learn not to be, I think not so, not so important as it's, it's thought of in, but I'd like to know which collectivist culture she's thinking of, this person's thinking of. I'd have to, Yeah. I mean, I lived in Denmark for years and uh, people there sometimes felt suffocated and wanted to come to America where there's more, you know, it was a, more wide open in a sense, you know, more, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I know there, you know, if you're thinking of China, I can, China's a, a it's a culture in which um, a lot, a lot of people are being observed a lot, graded, Italy people. So, and so, uh, and, and and interesting enough, it's like psychopathology. It's interesting the cross culturally, like for example, in parts of Africa, uh, psychotic episodes are not taken that seriously. They last two weeks, and here you're in a hospital. You know, mm -hmm. so it's a very interesting field, but uh, a, a good question, and we can learn from. I, I think we can, yeah, we, yes, we can learn from those cultures, and. Uh, I, um, but, and we can, we can, we, we should be able to learn from a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the collectivist cultures might also be, a, 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 some of the, there's a, a strong response here uh, to this issue of the need to compare, right? Mm -hmm. Wanting to get rid of that. This, uh, this, uh, 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 which uh, Nietzsche would have a lot to say about, right? Yeah. This desire to have, uh, I don't, I don't want these, I don't want, I not tolerate these differences. Now, one of the problems with Kierkegaard is he, he, I mean, one of the things he's charged with, and I think rightly so, is uh, he's is a person of, of uh, do, doesn't think much about the uh, issue of uh, economic equality or those things, right? And uh, of course, you could say that's an easy for a rich man to say, and he said that himself. He knew that, right? Um, in fact, there's this quote that's uh, debated all the time, and I've been on the side of the debate against Kierkegaard, and works a lot. Kierkegaard says, um, the one thing the poor person can give the rich person when there's a banquet is not to make the rich person feel guilty when they're looking in the window. I mean, what a cold thing to say, right? On the other hand, he's saying that no matter how poor you are, you can still be merciful, mm -hmm. right? But I think it's like this, this uh, he doesn't think these worldly differences are that important. You know, that's not going to decide our spiritual lives. And yeah. uh, on that, he was, uh, I, uh, I would have some issues with him. That's great. Well, I just want to um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Marino, and thank all of you for such excellent questions and for everybody uh, joining us over Zoom. Uh, I think we've sort of covered a lot of ground. We, we, we tasked Gordon with, you know, uh, covering a very large topic in 15 minutes, but uh, <laughs> it's been a, a great joy. So, um, so we invite you uh, at the end of this conversation, you'll get a, a link for our survey. If you're willing to do that, we ask that you might, um, or go ahead and click on the link in the chat. We, we'd love to get your feedback on, on how this event was um, for you. And um, also encourage you to check out uh, Professor Marino's recent book, Existential Survival, Survival Guide. If you found any of these uh, topics relevant uh, or interesting, you're gonna really enjoy that book uh, as I did. So um, yeah, so thank you all for coming. Thank you. I, I'd like uh, to say- Professor Marino, you know, I'll let you like have the last to... word. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well I, well, I want to thank everyone for being there and, and for some fantastic questions, but also feel free to email me at St. Olaf if you, you want to talk about something. Uh, my email is marino at stoloff.edu. And uh, if you're ever of a mind to, please uh, come down and see the, the Han Kiergaard Library. It's the best collection in the world on Kiergaard under one roof. So uh, uh, um, please stay in touch and thanks again. And uh, I'm much obliged. <laughs>